Hi folks and welcome to Through a Scottish Prism uh, midweek special. Um, we have hoped to get this out yesterday, but um, not going to go into too many difficulties, but anyway, here we are today. Now some of you will remember back in September 2022, I had the pleasure of interviewing Scott Forbes on about his book, A Long Walk to Justice. It concerns the case of the murder, the terrible murder of Jody Jones, age 14 in West Lothian and the eventual conviction and imprisonment of her boyfriend, young Luke Mitchell. Uh, ever since the trial and conviction, there has been question marks over um, that conviction and whether indeed it was a fair trial and whether all the evidence had been uh, put before the court, whether the evidence could be put properly before the court if proper witnesses. And Scott wrote a book which we uh, talked about Mm. Uh, and this is a follow-up because since that time, more evidence has come to light, and we're going to be talking about that today. But before that, I will do a quick reprise for any of you viewers who haven't, one, don't, don't know about the case or haven't seen the previous video or haven't been following this case, just to get us up to date. And to do that, I am joined by Scott and by Dr. Sandra Lean, criminologist, the two of these hello. Sandra, Scott, welcome to Through a Scottish Prism. Nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Good. Um, <coughs> as my intro said, Scott, you and I spoke back there in September 22. Um, very well received uh, by, by our audience. But I would just like to, <clears throat> as I say, for those who perhaps don't know about this case, is to do a quick reprise before we go on to this latest news. Now, if I omit anything or get anything out of order or anything you want to interject, just so we can set the scene for where we are today. Is that okay for you? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, on June the 30th, 2003, young Jodie Jones leaves her home to go the mile and a bit to go and see her boyfriend, um, Luke Mitchell. She never gets there. Um, and uh, at about six o'clock, we hear that um, Luke Mitchell is allegedly to have phoned Jodie's house looking for her. Um, and they say, no, she's left to go and see you. But she never appears. And by 10 o'clock, alarm bells are ringing. And the family of Jodie phone Luke to say, okay, if you know, we're going to go and look for her. Would you care to join us? Is that, have I got it right so far? Not quite. Mm -hmm. Luke or actually offered to go up the path that Jodie would have taken to see if she was there. And at it's six o'clock. This is at, at tw uh, 10 to 11 at night. So the family yeah, and right. he says he'll go up the path. If she's not there, he'll go to the family's house. Because this misunderstanding that there was a, a, an agreement between all of them to go searching is actually quite important later on. So so he okay. leaves to go up the path to your mum's house. And they say, Sandra, don't bother. I, I, I thought Roddy was talking at six, six o'clock at night. No, the search party but going, was Roddy no speaking about Jody going to meet Luke at six, five o'clock, no, the 11 o'clock. Five o'clock, yeah, I said five o'clock and then right. the search party started at 11. Aye, so, aye, okay, aye, aye, aye. So there wait, we are. So, um, but when he phoned the house at six o'clock, he was informed that they had left. Is that not correct? Not that Jody had left, but yes. they had left. Yes. So yes. I, I mean, I'm not going. I mean, an assumption. So when she didn't arrive at his house, he thought that they, whoever they were, um, Jody and who else had gone somewhere else. They weren't going to his house. Maybe that's what he thought. Who knows? I'm not going to speculate what he thought. But anyway, 11 o'clock, the alarm bells go off. He brings his dog with him, a dog called Mia. And it's important that I stress this part. The dog Mia um, was trained by a regimental sergeant major from the veterinary division or whatever they call them, the, vet, the veterinary wing of the army, to be a, a people finder, people hunter. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. So it's a it's, it's a highly <laughs> trained dog. It knows how to look for people. Right. So she was a, a young German shepherd dog, Roddy. 
and she was trained by a man called Jock Pride, who was a regimental sergeant major Royal Veterinary Corps, and he, he was a neighbour he looks. His son and Luke were friends, so he was training me, me up. When I when I chased Jock Jock Pride, I think in 2011, he, he described the dog as exceptional, and I asked him what what did he mean by that. He, he trained Alsatian dogs for a pup, for pups. He used to take pups, German Shepherd puppies, and he would take the clever ones to find people, the not so clever ones to find explosives, and the, the dumb ones, as he called it, the, to run the fence, you know, protection dogs. You just bite <coughs> anything and bark. And, and, and he, he took me up and de described her to me as exceptional. Hmm. Okay, so oh. this dog, Mia, and look, join the family. Now, the family is there is the granny, mm -hmm. her sister Janine, and the boyfriend Stephen Kelly. Is that right? Yeah. There's a third yes. party of four. Now, they look and they can't find her anywhere. And as they're leaving to go towards the granny's house, the granny turns around, stops, and says, No, let's go up and look one more time. Is there some, or some such words to that? Is that right? Oh, oh that's understood. Yeah, they, they haven't actually looked anywhere. They were waiting for Luke at the top of the path. When Luke arrived, the granny said, let's go back down the, the path he'd just come up. So they hadn't looked anywhere else at all. And the minute Luke got to them, they said, let's double check the path that he'd just come up. Right, so they double check, but they go down and the dog, they go, there's a gap, no, there's a, 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 a gusset, as we call it, and a gap in the, in the wall, a, a high wall. <coughs> and the dog puts its paws on top as if it's, it's, it's on to something, is that right? Yes. Um, the dog doesn't go over, but Luke climbs over, and there, a few meters away from this gap in the wall, they find he finds the body of his girlfriend. And yes. I stress, is, is that right? Are, are we, are we yeah. bang on course here? Yes. Nine, that, 19, just, 19, 19 meters away, Roddy. 19. 19. Meters. So mm. over just, over the V when Luke Mitchell climbs over the V. He goes to his left hand side towards where the dog could put, put his paws on the, the wall. So 19 meters for the V, he walks down and Jody's lying, lying uh, nearly up against a, a felling tree. Right. So now this is where it gets interesting, just for want of a better word. So it turns out this V darling girl of 14 has got 300 wounds in her of varying descriptions. 300 wounds, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so he climbs back over the wall, or uh, I don't know if he climbed over the wall at that point, but the family then join, and the granny is cuddling her granddaughter, as you would expect, cradling her in her arms. The, the, the sister's boyfriend's there, the sister's there, and they, they, someone, one of the group phones the police. Do we know which one it was that phoned the police? It was Luke. It was Luke. So Luke phones the police, um, to come and join them. And when the police arrive, is it two constables that arrived at first? Yeah. Who climbed the and they come, uh, they come. When you go, Scott. Oh, did the two constables an important part here? Both constables that arrived, they come from a place called Reed Drive. And then later on in, in the discussion, Reed Drive will become very important in this case. It's where the, a man called Dickie, one of the moped boys, stays. It's where the uh, Gordon Dickie, the, the, sorry, David Dickie, the father, travels the same path as the policeman, across, diagonally across a ploughed field. Mm -hmm. So that's where the police automatically, when they heard the child was missing, went to redrive. That's never been established. Why? Do you know there's a there's protocol in place, if you want to call it for a better word, that when ch children go missing, police go directly to certain addresses in the area. Now nobody ever, nobody's ever answered answered the question why the police went directly to Reed Drive, but they went directly to Reed Drive when they heard the child was missing, and then proceeded to walk over to where the, the search party is they get to Reed over Drive, a well, diagonally over a few. Okay, go back. To, so, so one would imagine they go to certain addresses, as you said, because for certain hmm. people who would be possibly if there's a missing child that they might want to. To go and visit. Yes, so then yes, the, the call comes yes. in that there's a body been found. They go diagonally across this plough field. They arrive. They climb over. More police arrive. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and they send. Obviously, they they tape it off. Yes or no? Did they tape no. it off? 
because they had no, no tape with them. They weren't expecting to go out to a murder. No. So the forensics no. arrived eventually, um, and the, the lady who was the forensics uh, inspector, what do we call it, uh, uh, forensics lady, she's a bit returned, can't climb the wall, and just decides to go home. Yep. Correct? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Yes. But someone eventually, the, the photographers arrived, forensic photographers arrived. They're mixed on the scene, is that right? Yeah. Well, and because it's Sandra, inside, sorry, when you go, Scott. Sorry, Sandra's laughing, and, 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 and rightly so. Roddy, the pathologist arrives, you say she was too heavy and, and a sore back to climb over a bee. Listen, listen, it's not a difficult climb for anybody. Do you know, I've had children over there, my dog jumps over, it's not a high, it's maybe, oh, I don't know, four feet. But, but if you can't access the locust over the wall, you can walk 300 yards either way and you can walk in through a field without climbing any fence or anything. You can just walk directly to the locust. She was too lazy. I'm talking one, two in the morning, she arrives, right? And then um, she's too lazy to do they walk three or four hundred yards, so they just go home. They just leave Jody right. lying, at, lying, at, what, going, lying the, in the I mean, overnight if, in the rain. If you bother to get up at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, and get there and think, I've changed my mind. It's a dead child. It's a dead child. The, the other oh. thing is, they made no effort to get a replacement for her. So she gets there, can't go over the wall, um, going home. But they don't go, right, we better call somebody else. They just go, ah, oh, well. No pathologist, never mind. And so the, then these photographers arrived to take photographs of the crime scene or the alleged crime scene. Um, and mm. they then commit some really terrible mistakes, <coughs> errors, unforgettable and unforgivable mistakes. They start cutting branches off of trees to get better light. Because um, we've got to remember, this is June. It's, I don't know what time it would be by now, but the time they've all arrived, seven ish. So it's still light. Still light. But they no, want no, more it's light. About five o'clock in the morning by the time the photographers get there. Four, five o'clock. It's five in the, in the morning before they get there. So it's early light. But they want more light. So they start cutting down branches of trees and disturbing the the crime scene. Plus, the fact you've got photographers walking all over it. You've had the family walking all over it. You've Police had uh, all sorts of people walking all over it. Um, and yeah. they've put. Overnight, they put before they go away. The police they get a tarpaulin and they put wee Jodie on top of the tarpaulin, or roll her onto it, and then pull her 10, 10 meters away. Again, oh, yeah. something you shouldn't do. Now, anyone who's watched, you know, any of these crime programs in television, though, you don't move the body, you don't touch the crime scene. You're destroying evidence. So they put her on that and they drag her. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we, when Scott and I were looking at the, the crime scene pictures again, we discovered that where they cut the branches down, the, and, and there's blood on these branches, first of all, they stood them up against the wall, obviously, to give them access after they cut them down. And then you see them later on, and they're just spread, spread around on the ground. So, so they've, they've cut them down, then they've put them against the wall, then they've thrown them on the ground. Think of the cross-contamination in that one process alone. Mm -hmm. And then the other well, thing they did, you know, we put Jodie on the tarpaulin and they dragged her, that's awful. But somewhere in the in the papers is a note that somebody came and gathered up all the clothing that was strewn around. And we all we know is it landed up in the one place. So they weren't bagged separately to to you know maintain the So you should photograph it, bag it. Yeah. Photograph it, bag it, but they didn't. No, they just gathered it all up. And and we still don't know to this day who did that either. Roddy, well, when, when the forensic team arrived, I think it's eight in the morning, Sandra, correct? Now, I'm no brilliant with fine details here. I think eight, eight in the morning, the forensic team arrived. And and the, and the man says, the, the, the man leading the team says they had not managed the scene very well. And, and, and it, in other words, they had botched the whole thing. See where Jody was found is, I don't believe it's a crime scene, but it's part of a crime scene. It was botched. The whole thing was contaminated. They had allowed people, photographers, to march over it, cut branches, they, they trampled over it, left Jody lying on a tar tarpaulin, in the rain all night uncovered. So by the time they arrived at 8 in the morning, 
the, the where Jody was found, the locust was botched. The whole thing was just ruined. Forensically, it was destroyed. For, for a bit, be, better phrase, forensically destroyed by eight o'clock in the morning. Eight hours after, nine hours after Jody was finished, where Jody was found was forensically contaminated. It was, it was ruined. I'd like to come back to that, to the crime. Oh, yes, yeah, but the next bit I want to do is they, they, they take the family, not look, they take the family, the police put them in a the cart and start driving them around different houses in West Lothian for a wee cup of tea, <coughs> meet the family, etc. Um, they don't remove their clothing or anything for forensic evidence. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> Again, this listen, is a record, is it not? Oh, listen, Roddy, they, 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 they had that. <laughs> they under Sandra's laughing. They, they, they took the, the, the search party to a police station. They take Luke, 14 year old boy, separate him away from everybody, strip him yeah. naked, take scraping his feet under his nails, his residue, his nails, his hair samples, photographed his body, no scratches, no bruising. Sorry, bruising on his leg for, for a thousand days days before, right? But there's no scratches, no blood. So they take Luke away and forensically test him, give him the full works. They've got the, cert, the rest of the search party are in the police station. So all they had to do was please remove your clothes and give him a white suit, like which is normal. And instead of doing that, they started ferrying him around Dal Keith for cups of coffee at different people's houses. They took the grandmother to Jody's house. Now it's turned out as, as we go for our own. Um, Jody's brother becomes a main suspect in this case. So they they take the grandmother to his house <laughs> for a cup of tea rather than take her clothes. She's been cradling Jody. Stephen Kelly been over the wall, he's cuddled Janine. So the, the whole search part is forensically of interest. Eh? And they, they took nothing. They went back to the granny, I think, five days later, six days, five days later, and asked her for the clothes that they were wearing on the night. And then she had washed everything. She had washed her clothes, Stephen Kelly's clothes, and Janine, Janine's clothes. So the, the forensically, the, 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 the whole case is botched. But <laughs> on the first night, I'm not laughing like it's a joke, it's just, as you re, re, recall this in your mind, Roddy, the, the, the thing is uh, mind-boggling. Do you know, imagine having a person in a police station covered in Jody's blood. Obviously, you've cradled a body, Jody's injuries, so you're, the, the, your granny's covered in Jody's blood and forensics, and, 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 they, and they start driving her about to different houses for cups of tea and coffee. But, but even, like, even granny by cradling. Uh, sorry, on you go, Sandra. Sorry, even on top of that, they, they take Luke immediately to Dalkeith Police Station, like 15 minutes, and he's away. They leave the search trio in the car park for another two hours, with members of Jody's family coming and going, phones getting swapped, some people taking phones away, oh, oh, oh. before they even take them to the police station. And then, after they take them to the police station, they do what Scott's just said. So we've got this two hour gap where they're all intermingling and getting in and out of vehicles and everything before they even get them to the police station and then decide to do nothing with them. Yeah. So yeah. And it's all cross contaminated. Absolutely. The, the other thing is that <clears throat> you mentioned that the granny was had blood over her from the 300 wounds, understandable. But when they stripped Luke, there wasn't a drop of blood in him. There wasn't a bit of DNA in him. There wasn't any of his nothing. her DNA on him. No. And as it transpires later, there's none of Luke's DNA on Jody. Is that correct? No, nothing. Yeah. And they never produced any in court. There was nothing in, introduced by the prosecution to say there was some of his DNA. So they can take it there wasn't. But yeah. to get back to the scene of the crime, the alleged scene of the crime, where the body was found at least. Now, we highlighted that she um, had 300 wounds, but it transpired that she had lost over six pints of her blood. Six liters. Well, I, think, I understood your body only held eight, eight pints of blood. I might be wrong. The, the, well, pathologist, well, the pathologist said 5.5 to 6 litres. Litres? Well, there you go. Mm -hmm. It's something new. I, I, I understood it was old. Well, any, anyway, so litres. Well, I will send this photograph this morning from a newspaper article a day after the murder. <coughs> the DC, D, DS Craig Doby, Walter Craig Doby. I will go to him later. I was saying this this morning. The range Jodie's colour soaked in her blood. Right? See it? Yeah, not really. No, not very good. Ah, right. So, yeah. even though we seen two days in. <laughs> ah, certainly. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tweet it later as well, right? Somebody sent me some 
decent articles this morning, and um, to do with the blood. Do you know the, the colour? Dobby's saying the colour is saturated in Jody's blood, <laughs> and Luke Mitchell's clothing has got nothing. No, yeah. there's never been a Tracy blood or a forensic link ever yeah. to link Luke so, to that killing. So back at the crime, the, the, the scene of well, the body, where the body is, there is no sign of, you would expect to be a massive amount of blood round about the body, Sandra. I'm right in saying there was no massive amount of blood round the body. Nothing, nothing. There's a little spray on the wall, which they claimed was arterial spray from the cutthroat injuries. We've seen this, these pictures. And I think Scott said before he's seen, he's seen more blood from a nosebleed. This is yeah. not in any way, shape or form arterial spray on the wall. They didn't take soil samples. There's no mass pool of blood either where Jody, Jody's body was lying or at the foot of the wall because they said that in order to stop getting blood stained, they said that the killer had her face in the wall and cut her throat from behind. And that's how he avoided getting blood on him. If that was the case, then you would expect there to be a pool of blood at the base of the wall, mm -hmm. if not under where her body fit. There's none there either. Oh. There's no soil no, samples. We've lost six litres of blood. There's no blood stain. There's been no soil samples taken. There's no blood on the, the suspect. There's no DNA on the suspect. No. Um, it begs the question, why Why is he a suspect? And the reason is he was not um, a goth, but um, I don't know, what, what do you call these semi-goths, Sandra? It's a skater, a skater boy, I believe, is the term. <laughs> goth gives you the impression of the dark makeup, the dark hair, the black clothes. Um, he wore, like, coloured bandanas and baggy trousers, but not the dark, dark stuff. So... Right. I don't know about these fashions. <laughs> no, 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 I, I've never even heard of the phrase too recently. Um, but he arrived, the police arrive, and for some reason, he's our man, Scott. This is what they've said. They've made up their mind by just looking at him. Because he's different. He's, he's, not, Ro, 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 he's not there in a uh, suit and shirt and tie. Uh, Roddy, when the police arrive, the CID, Craig Dobby, I'm going to name him a trace this man, by the way, we want to address for him. And then um, I'm not going to say online, but I'm going to go and interview him very shortly. Um, Craig Dobby arrives and, and, and Jodie's aunt, Agnes, is there. And Craig Dobby and her friends, her colleagues, they work in the children's panel and child safeguarding together. So hello, Agnes, how are you doing? And all the Joneses are treated now, they're not treated as suspects or people of interest. Luke Mitchell's sitting away from him, clapping his dog. The police that leave the Jones house, the two uniformed police that go to the house, uh, to take details. They get told by someone in the house, we don't know who, they tell the police that, that Jody left the house with Luke, right? So they police then come to the car park, tell the CID, oh, who's that over here? That's the boyfriend. He found the body, but they believed he was the only person to find the body, and they also believed he left the house with Jody. So they've just looked over, seen a weirdo on the phone to his mum, telling his mum, stop fucking phoning and that. Who's that? That's the boyfriend, or he's the killer. They just made their mind up within a 20 minutes. He's a killer. And, and focused every bit of attention went only that boy. But the fact is, and we'll come back to it, but she did leave home with someone. As we yes. said, yes. we said, because when he phoned the house, they said they have left. So she left the house with someone. That someone wasn't Luke, though. That's no. the point. But to go back no. to the, the this scene, we've, we've described how there's so much blood and whatnot. But there was no blood, even on those samples of clothing, Sandra, on uh, Jodie's trainers or her bra, there was no blood, <clears throat> no. she'd had a throat cut. Yeah, the, there was what they called a contact stain on, on the back clasp of the bra, and that's just where somebody's touched it. So so there's none of the saturation that you would imagine from the sort of injuries that she had. Yeah. Um, bra was clean, the trainers were clean. It so makes no sense. We can assume she was stripped before she was murdered then, is that right? Uh, yeah, but not according to the prosecution. Yeah, so because if, if she had, if they had, the blood would have been everywhere. Yeah. There, there was another unusual yeah. thing about her socks, Scott. Her Scott, socks, had obviously, when she was dragged, now we don't know, dragged by the police or or by the perpetrator, perpetrators, because um, <coughs> there was mud in the inside of her socks. Her socks were put back in her feet and there was mud ah, in the inside. 
I saw somebody, somebody um, put Jodie's socks back on, Jodie. And uh, listen, she, she's got, um, she's been dragged, the feet have been dragged along the ground. And and so the soil is on the, the outside of the sock. And whoever put the socks back on, put them back on inside out. So the mud's on the inside the, inside instead of the outside. So we knew the socks had come off and been put back on. Who by who was never investigated. But it should have been, because it's either more contamination of this, the crime scene or yeah. or, 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 the, or the perpetrator of the, of the, the murder. <laughs> For some reason, put this all no, back. Did, and as you say, it was never investigated, which again never, is never. is criminal for want of a better word. Yeah. Or well, so, even even the blood. Myself and Sands are just recently. There's a lot of oh, most most of Jody's injuries are post mortem, right? But the physicality is punched, kicked, dragged through the hair. Was all prior to death. So the, she she's got a real bad scarring on the face, real deep off. These are right, and and one on an arm. Both were done before she was defensive. killed. Yes, defensive. Put it appears to be the, like that, and, yeah. and somebody's oh listen, it nearly cuts her hand off on it. Right, it's, it's it's right through the muscle into the bone. You know, like and and the what and the scarring on her on her face. Oh Jesus! Now, whoever done the two two wounds, she was still living. These are the post mortem injuries. These are pre pre mortem. So somebody was covered in blood. Now I've seen these kind of injuries in my, my life, and and and, and uh, defensive wounds and, and facial scarring. They they bleed. There's a lot. Jody's lost a lot of blood. But which, which of course, Scott brings me back. Professor Basuta, if I may, keep me right here. Basuta, but it brings me back to the crime scene. As you say, well, Basuta no, says that the wound on her arm. Sorry. I'm going to say which brings me back to the crime scene where there's no blood. There's also no sign of a struggle at when the body's been uh, found. No. So, uh, and what you're describing about Nothing. defensive, you would expect blood, you would expect, and you would also expect some DNA to pass between the murderer and the and, and the victim, but there's none of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there are some blood splashes on branches, but we're talking spots, just drips on branches. That's it. There's there's nothing that indicates this huge fight mm -hmm. that we know went on before right. she was killed. Nothing. <coughs> but, 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 says the, the wound on her arm, Roddy. Professor Basuto says that would weaken her. Like the, the, the loss of blood from just the, the wound on her arm would have weakened her. No, the, the blood, but, but where's the, where, there was no blood. That, <laughs> there was no, when you see the crime scene, the, the, the forensic team say there is no sign of a struggle. Now, myself, as I, I've been there a hundred times, when you look at the ground, Roddy, if you scrape your, it's soft, soft, yeah. soft um, mud. Leaves you would you would see the struggle. There's no struggle. Where Jody was found, there's no struggle. The forensic team say there's no struggle. There's no big loss of blood for the defence wound or the, the wound on her face. Okay. So let's nothing. go back to let's go on and let, let's explore that a wee bit because the other thing that you noticed is it's a thing that I'm sure a lot of our, our viewers want to know. It's called liver mortis. And and if you care to explain that, what liver mortis is, one of you. Well, Sandra. <laughs> Basically, after the blood stops circulating, it will settle, it will drop. Gravity just brings it down. So anywhere that the body is touching something, that there's weight on it, the, the blood, the now coagulating blood, will settle in those areas. But if a body's moved, or if there's something restricting the blood from settling, you won't get that that coloured pattern, you, you'll have potentially just a white area where the blood couldn't get to. Okay. So, so when um, Scott was looking at the pictures, there's this this band across the back of her legs, and if someone was, for example, being carried over a shoulder and an arm was across the back of the legs to steady them, that band there matches exactly what you would expect to see. So, in in that stage after death, when when you know the the body's the, the blood starts <laughs> in certain places, held like that, that band matches being held like that. The the, the coagulation doesn't happen there. Right. So that makes us think, Scott, that she was murdered somewhere and dumped where they found the body. Would that be right? Excellent. Yes, definitely. My opinion, Jan. Listen, 
It's not just my opinion, Roddy. Sorry, I'm saying my opinion. That's not true. It's many people's opinion. We, for the last 15 years, we've been discussing this, and, and very few people, very few people believe Jodie was killed where she was found. Jodie was carried there. My opinion, she was two over her shoulder and, and carried like this in the, in the arm, one over the back of her legs. Regrettably, Scott, the prosecution believed and the jury believed and the judge believed that that's where she'd been killed for some well, reason. Well, I, I, mean, I don't think it, I don't think the defence ever explored it. Well, I don't, I don't think it was ever really explored at trial if she was killed here or carried there. They just yeah, accepted. Yeah, the reason they believe she was killed there is because the police said that's where she was killed. Nobody but, questioned her. Because oh, uh, and it was never questioned, Roddy. I'm, I'm wanting to get to the new evidence that we're uh, well, taking as long because it's important though that people understand that the absolute mess of this inquiry, how forensic evidence was was lost, damage is not accounted for, how all yeah. sorts of things were wrong before we even get to poor Luke getting convicted and sent to jail. But the other thing was statements, as you alluded to one earlier, Scott, about oh, Luke left with her from the house here when he had never been there. But there was other statements that were made uh -huh. that were changed over, a t over time oh. between Luke being arrested, charged and going to court. Statements were changed. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, massively. Massively, Roddy. Um, let, let, I'm, I'm trying to be polite when I say this. Um, the search party, for want of a better word, search party, uh, Janine, the sister, Stephen Kelly, and the granny Alice Walker, who, who, who should have been charged with perverting the course of justice. Yes. She, she scared witnesses, she oh, washed clothes, oh, listen, it's endless what Alice, but Alice Walker's statements and Janine's statements and Stephen Kelly's statements all supported Luke. When they walked back down the path, the dog done this on the wall, and, and how he looked nervous, and, and, he, and when he come back over, he was ashen faced and nearly fainted, and, and by the time six, six whatever statements later, oh, Luke Mitchell just walked right over, he climbed over the V, walked directly to the body, and he come back over, and he, he never showed any emotion. And the dog like did reading, nothing. And the dog done nothing, yes, I. And, and, and three, them, three people support this. Alice Walker was a wee bit further back, so she can't kind of say exactly what the dog done, but every one of them say the dog acted in this way, Janine and Stephen, clearly. And then the three of them all say Luke Mitchell done this and done that, and he looked ashen-faced and he nearly fainted. And the two police officers who have seen agreed with this and says he looked like this. Oh, six, seven weeks later and six statements later, oh, Jesus, Roddy, it was like two different stories. Complete was, different yeah. stories. Luke Mitchell knew exactly where the body was. He climbed over the wall. The dog never reacted to nothing. He just climbed over. And when he came back over, he, he, he was emotionless. And oh, gee, Jesus, the, the statements are um, contradict each other. And shall we say polite? I'll say politely. Listen, they're just lies. And in my opinion, only my opinion, the police went back to these people and told them, we think that Mitchell, that your statements are helping us. And, and he, we believe he's a killer or whatever. Mm -hmm. And these statements changed dramatically on genuinely it well, was like reading two different books well, we, we know <coughs> from day two the police were telling people in this area that luke was the killer and it was only a matter of time before they got the evidence to prove it so if they were telling other people in the area i don't think there's any doubt that they were telling jody's family that as well they must have been so from day well, two, well, they know, know it. Him. No, no, go into conspiracy stuff here because you can quite easily done. But facts are the thing. People, Dal keeps a very small place first and foremost, right? Everybody knows everybody. They're friends with the police. The Jones, Agnes is friendly with Craig Dobie, but but there's members of the Jones family in Dal Keith police, and as we find out later on. <laughs> uh, Matthews for Sky, James Matthews for Sky, who carried out the interview, you know, in Luke's house. His brother is the, the local policeman in Dalkeith, the community police officer. And he's telling everyone, everyone in Dalkeith, within two days, Luke Mitchell's a killer. He's at boxing clubs, football clubs, minors clubs, and he's telling everybody, we've got the wee bastard, we've got him, we've got him, but we're just waiting on evidence. Now that's after two days. So if the whole of Dalkeith <laughs> now know within two or three days, Luke Mitchell's a killer. He's not a killer, but that's what they've been told by the local police. So the, the, the statements for the search party, oh, the, the changes, Roddy, are absolutely... 
Right. So what? we know the change. We, we know the change statements. Let's go back again to the crime scene. Now, mm -hmm. what forensic evidence they have found, which is bizarre, they found on Jody's T-shirt, Sandra, sperm mm -hmm. samples. That yeah. sperm sample is not Luke Mitchell's. No, it's a full DNA profile, and that's important because there were a lot of partial profiles, and lots of people have argued, argued that the partial profiles could have been this person, could have been that person. No, they can't. They're partials. Can't name anybody. This one is a full mm -hmm. DNA profile, full match for right. not Luke, Jody, Stephen Kelly, the, the, the yeah. sister's boyfriend. Stephen Kelly. <clears throat> yeah, and he's not a suspect. His sperm mm -hmm. is found in the wee lasses, and they and they they, 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 they wave this away by saying, "Well, she must have borrowed her sister's T-shirt." They actually go oh. to him and give him that that. Oh. Um, Please tell him to say that. They tell him to say that. Yeah. Oh. We, do we know for definite? Do we know that? Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, listen. Fifteen. Sandro, correct me again on date, Sodi. You see, when the forensic report came back saying there's no ties to Luke Mitchell, they, they have a press release that day, and uh, Craig Dobie's friend Agnes uh, comes and says this: jo Jody and Janine are always sharing T-shirts. Well, they're now telling the public the excuse, and I use the word excuse. The police give to Stephen Kelly. Stephen Kelly doesn't come up and say, oh, my sperm's on Jody before <coughs> Jody Borry and Janine's T-shirt. He doesn't know. He says he doesn't know how to sperm's here. So the police go and tell him, your sperm must be on Jody because Jody's Borry and Janine's T-shirt. They're two, I mean, two, two miles apart. I'm just thinking of that practically. You know, you go to your sister and say, I'd like to borrow a T-shirt. And, you know, oh, the sister oh. would, you know, ah, here's one that my boyfriend put his sperm on. Here, have that one. You would at well, least give your, your sister... Like, Janine knowing. Oh, so, that, so, yeah, so, she, so she didn't put it in the wash after it had, her boyfriend had put sperm all over it. Come on. No, no, and Jody borrowed it, apparently. A, a drawer. No, I mean, you come in and see a dirty one. Surely you're going to a drawer and look for a clean one if you're into borrow a t shirt. Exactly. I mean, anyone would. But anyway, again, speculate. I don't want to get into speculation. Um, to, to this day, it's never been proven or confirmed that that t shirt was Janine's, just, just for interest's sake. Never been so we don't even know if it was a borrowed T-shirt. No. Oh, well, there you go. Well, there's no, here's, there's here's no the DNA. worst than that, well, Scott. Now, this is the one mm -hmm. that gets me. 15 metres, I believe, from the body, the police found a condom with sperm in it. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Fresh, and fresh semen. Fresh semen, eh? And they, they didn't involve it in the... It wasn't put into evidence, was it? They, they couldn't match it to anybody. No, it couldn't. Uh, but it certainly wasn't Luke Mitchell's sperm. No, no. No, no. no. Oh, it turned out to be a boy called James Faulkner. Roddy. Well, I was just coming out. It was and three years later they found out who, who, who uh, it belonged to, yes? Yes, yes. When you go. James, uh, James Faulkner. Faulkner commits an assault. He gets charged with an assault, I believe. And, and, uh, and when he gets charged with the assault, they take him uh, his DNA. And then put in the database and it matches what the, the condom that they had found three years earlier. And, and so that how looks in the jail. Go on. And so, and, and how did James Faulkner talk that away? This is found 15 metres on the night beside the body. Yes. Um, how did he talk that away? I'll leave that to Scott. He, he, he walked three of maybe 500 metres, maybe uh, five, 600 metres from his home to go into the woods to have. A clean wank. I've never heard the one in my life. Three and five, six hundred meters. He walks into a wood to, to 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 have a wank into a condom. A clean wank. My investigation over the years, Roddy. He was nineteen, I think, at the time, and he was in the woods allegedly with a fourteen or fifteen year old girl, and so he didn't want to say that, so he, he had a clean wank. And then years later, when he's working, he tells his workmates it was a married woman, and he couldn't say who the married woman was. But at the time he told the police three years after he went in the woods for a clean wank. And and it was just accepted. That was just accepted that he, a man walked 600 metres to walk into a wood, uh, 15 metres away. And by the way, well, well, he's something this clean wank. So he's lying 15 metres away, mutely. And he's not spotted the body. 15 metres away from a dead thing. body. Aye, ah, aye. Yeah, and, and, he, and, and it was just accepted. Just, uh, uh, just well, taking it face value. I have led a sheltered life. I have. However, I've never heard of anyone walking 500 metres putting a condom on to crack one off. I, I mean, that's just beyond anything I've ever heard in my life. Well, the following morning, when he heard that 
a girl's body had been found be behind the wall, it goes back out onto the path behind another tree and does the same again. But he's not subject to... Uh, he, he might well, have the next day. He's like, just get the next roll back and he goes the next day. Was there no police here to stop him being in a tree behind a murder scene? Well, there were supposed to be. He said it was cordoned off. And so he might be able to go up there and masturbate oh. behind a tree beside a murder scene <clears throat> from the night before. Th those I mean, this, this, this is Keystone <laughs> Cops stuff. Yeah, those, those gardens opened out onto the cordoned off area. So, so he could technically have got into the cordoned area. How he got away with that when the police was crawling with police is anybody's guess. But yeah, that was that was his first thought the following morning. Oh my goodness, fourteen year old found murdered. What what should I do? Uh, it's bizarre. But as you're saying, Scott, they're going around every all over Dalkeith and all over West Lothian telling people they've got the killer. They're just needing the evidence. Now it seems to me <clears throat> they weren't so concerned themselves because they went to the FBI across the pond, massive expense to get what I think they maybe hoped for would be the killer blow, the, the silver bullet to put away a look. And they asked the FBI to profile, giving them all the everything that they found to profile the killer. Is that right? Yep. And the, well, what did the FBI say? Well, at the time, what the FBI said, we don't know to this day because the entire report was redacted. Every single thing that you could have read in it was gone, blacked out. Redacted. So, yeah, much, much later, um, a couple of the FBI officers came forward and said, there is no way that type of crime, um, Luke Mitchell would have fitted the, the, the profile for it. They, they called it a lust killing. And, you know, for a start, he didn't have the life experience just because of his age to have built up that type of um, psychological mindset. So at the time, we don't know what it said. Later, the FBI said it had to, whoever it identified or whoever it pointed towards, it was not Luke Mitchell. Yeah. Um, but there's two or three other things I'd like to ask about. One they, they really didn't come up with a motive for this sudden frenzied. I mean, we're, I go back, I repeat, folks, 300 wounds. Yes. So it's a frenzied attack. They, they, to this day, they still haven't produced a credible motive, have they? Do you know, do you know what they gave, a, gave us the motive, Roddy? The, the, Luke Mitchell had a, remember, he's 14. He had a girlfriend or and, and some for, for some holiday had been on. And, and she looked like Jodie, and because Jodie had found out he had another girlfriend, they took over the wall and killed her. Yeah, 300 wounds, uh, a friend, but this uh, is a uh, frenzied attack. This is, not a, yeah. this is not a crime of passion moment, which is usually, in, you know, a single, I mean, I, I'm not a forensic scientist, I'm not a criminologist, Sandra, but usually, you know, a crime of passion is, is as it says, it's passionate, it's a one bump, a one hit, a two hit, or whatever, something. It's not a frenzied 300 no. you know, wound shot, is it? No. They also never found a, a murder weapon, did they? After all this, 300 <laughs> wounds and they couldn't find a murder weapon. No. Well, Roddy, that's maybe... I think they did find the murder weapon. They found a large bowie knife and a skip maybe 500 metres away from where Jody was found. And and it's in a, it was in a garage, a garage skip used for scrap metal. And uh, the police found a large bowie knife, knife covered in blood with the tip broken off and they sent a forensic team into the, the garage and emptied the skip. Now, we only found this out well, last year, a year ago, and um, yeah, it was yeah. hidden to the defence and, and subsequently it's been destroyed, but uh, the police had a large bowie knife covered in blood um, as, as a production and the defence team never, well, never ever aware of it, ever. Um, two other things before we, we, two or three things before we move on to this latest evidence. I, I'm just going through my notes here. I mean, folks, I've got four or five pages here of notes on this. That's how, how it is. It's, I don't want to miss out on any of these vital things. But years later, there's some things happened that are also, again, didn't lead to Luke Matchell getting a um, release. And one of them was one of, one of the girls who gave a statement during the initial inquiry, we 14-year-old girl at the time, 
Because later we found out bullied and coerced by the police to change her statement. Isn't that right, Scott? Oh, every child, every yeah. child in this case, Roddy, was coerced and bullied. I've spoken to several, I can't name them, obviously. Sanders the same. Sanders spoken over the years. And, and they tell you, if, if they say anything good about Luke Mitchell, they were bullied and... Um, listen, he, here's a wee example. We just mentioned a murder weapon. A 14-year-old boy was one of the people who found it. The police go to his school and they pick him up to his school with two his parents and they drive him home. And while they're driving him home, they tell him, the knife he found, son, is not the knife you think. It was an old cheap thing with a yelly handle that a mechanic broke and just threw away. Did he ever worry about it? So the boy then goes home and his dad gets told us and his dad tells me last year, two years ago, whatever, um, nah, that knife isn't a bowie knife, Scott. It was a cheap thing. So they bullied a 14-year-old boy from school to tell him that the knife he found, he was seeing things and imagining things. It was a stupid thing. And we boys just accepted it. Years later, we now found out, we've got sworn to testimony, by the way, more than one, two or three. And then, then we found out in the production, hidden for the defence, the large bowie knife was taken for a skit. And they're telling a 14-year-old boy, he never found a bowie knife, son. He found a cheap yearly handle thing. That's and, and that goes right through the, the, the whole investigation on every I, child that spoke out in favour of Luke Lawrence yeah, Angel. I've spoken to a mother, a, a few mothers, but one in particular who told me, you know, that her child was refusing to budge, was refusing to say what they wanted to say, they wanted her child to say about Luke. And I'm just going to say what she told me. Um, the police then turned to the mother and said, do you know what will happen to your kid if people in this area find out your kid is supporting that wee bastard? This is like day three of the investigation. So so not only were they pressuring the kids themselves, they were pressuring the parents to pressure the kids to, to just to terrify everybody to get them to say what they needed them to say. It's wine bottom. <clears throat> Another one, years later, they also found that a known violent rapist who was never questioned um, was less than 400 yards from the murder scene on the day of the murder. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. I think you named him in your book, Scott, did you not? Green. He, of Robert Green. Sandra, sa, sa, his, his surname was Green, his name was... He, he was called the... Um, do, do you know Rosalind Chapel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, he was called after that because he, he listen randomly driving along the road. He seen a Dutch student, just randomly, just picked a woman randomly for the street and beat her to a pulp. They, they, when they found her, they thought she had been run over, Roddy. Her injuries were so bad. He dragged her in the woods and just raped her and beat her to a pulp. And he was visiting his sister, 500 to 400 yards, very close to where that murder weapon was found. As we caught right. a GBC, the garage on the day of the murder, and he on was the day of the murder, never ever questioned. <coughs> Has he been questioned to this day? No, 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 We went back to the police and said, was he um, questioned as, because they put out a thing saying they were checking out all known sex offenders and all that sort of thing. So we went back to the police and said, was he included in that process? Was he questioned as part of that wider process? Yeah. And, um, from memory, their response was, "Well, the case is closed, so we have we have no need to to investigate anybody else." So okay. they didn't ask answer the question. Did they question him at the time? But what they were making answer, probably, they said, no. from our inquiries, yeah. would that be the standard answer? So they didn't, yeah. obviously. Um, yeah. But the other thing is, at this point, there's two things I want to come on to now before we move on to new evidence. The daily records step in, and not just the record, but in particular the daily records step in. Um, and I remember those headlines because uh, I should say when I started this and to to talk to Scott, I said, "Yeah, I remember that case. God, it was all over the record." They had this boy, a fourteen-year-old child, um, as Scotland's answer to Charles Manson. Had they not, Scott? Oh, listen, for over a year, Roddy, for over a year, the devil. He, he was a spawn, the devil's spawn, he was a beast. He was, listen, everybody thought Luke Mitchell was having the sexual relationships with his mother. Um, he was killing dogs. Oh, listen, just listen. And, and the daily record led, led for the front. I must say that. They've changed their tune a wee bit, Roddy, the last few weeks. The daily record, well, long last, of stuff now that's known too negative. 
Yeah, but you remember the Daily Record, like the rest of the gutter press or whores, and they'll change their story if it's going to sell a newspaper. Hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred percent. Get embarrassed about it. Um, but they, God, they, they destroyed God. a family completely, did they not? Ah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Listen, young Luke was fourteen. He had an attitude. He was giving fingers to press, and, and they said, "Oh, he's he's arrogant." You've only got two options when, when you're faced with stuff like that. You've got two options. You either face it up, Roddy, which he did. Or, or he curl into a ball and, and die, right? And if he had done that, he would have said, ah, he's hiding. And the fact that he, he faced it up, oh, he's arrogant, he's a killer. He, there, there was, no, there was a, a lose-lose situation for Mitchell and his family, by the way. What they've done to that family is that it was a witch trial. Mm -hmm. Listen, forget was... Luke Mitchell. See, his mother, Corrie, and they, they, they conducted a witch trial, Dal Keith style, 2003. Without, yeah. I saw the evidence, the daily record on stories of a family. Just lies. It's a devil. John Scott, who, K KC, who's now Lord Scott, by the way, I'm, I'm delighted for him. He's a nice man, right? Um, now he's, he was very supportive to Luke. And he always says, how can you defend yourself against accusations of being evil? Now, hmm. when you read the paper, evil, the devil spawn, how can you defend yourself against that? Or the, you can't. It's impossible. Hmm. If somebody says you're evil, right, and, and you're right in the Daily Record, you're evil. The whole public then start believing you're evil. How can you then Correct. try and defend yourself? Correct. Especially, especially yeah. when the jury that's going to hear the so-called well, evidence was, yeah. has been steeped in that media coverage for 19 yeah. months. Correct. That was my next question to you, actually. I was going to say, I'm not a criminologist, you're a criminologist. I remember, if I could remember 19 years ago, when, when, when I, I said, yeah, I remember that case. When I, so, as you say, it lied, the jury... There was no way that boy could get a fair trial or a fair jury. No, the trial should be held in, in, in Ireland or, or, or England or something because he was never going to get a fair trial in Scotland in no, the Daily listen, Reader, the Daily Reader, no, listen, leadership I, area. In Edinburgh, five, mi five miles away from where the murder happened, they take him to a trial. They even asked, listen, Donald Finley's his crew, see, I'm not going to be critical. Finley had just got, Finley got a beating in court. Lord Tumble, Alan, Alan Tumble, KC, gave him what lawyers call a doing. He got bounced all about that court. He argued that the, the trial should be held in Glasgow or Aberdeen or Stirling or, you know, the, the, when the High Court's travelling. And, and they rejected that. They rejected that. They took, they took Luke Mitchell and, and, and trial in Edinburgh, five miles away from where they live. I'm laughing. I'm not laughing because it's funny, Rod. It's even made you go in your mind. How can you get a fair trial in, in Edinburgh when everybody, everybody, Believed that Luke Mitchell was the, the, the spawn of the devil, he was evil, he was sleeping with his mother, he was torturing animals, it was all lies. But they took and him the, into court and, and the judge uh, judge uh, believed <coughs> any danger of um the jury being prejudiced by this media coverage could be adequately taken care of by a, a direction from the judge to mm -hmm. put out of their minds everything that they dread. How would they know? How would they know what in their head was from what in their head and, and what was from the, the mm. human beings can't do that, but that's mm. what the judge thought was going to be the, the solution. Try them in Edinburgh, but tell the jury tell the jury to forget everything that's been in the papers for the last 19 months. No, well, I, I, I can tell you, and Sandra will confirm this because she spoke to people herself. People in the jury are uh, very concerned in the verdict they found. Yeah. They found out they were being pressurised, some now are having counselling, because they found a wee boy guilty of murder because he felt they were pressured. Mm -hmm. Media coverage, and this is grown up people 15, 17 years later telling me a story, that they're getting counselling, they cry at night because they, they reached the wrong verdict. Also, can I tell you, of, ah, I'm saying it publicly, the, the prosecution team and people in the legal fraternity were shocked that they got guilty. Uh, sure. I'm going to come. I'm going to come on to them. Trust mm -hmm. me. I'm going to come on to them. <laughs> but to counteract all this, and since Luke Mitchell and his mother Sandra took a polygraph, now yes. to, to make it clear, polygraphs, as we know in this country, are not uh, legal. You can't and it, it put them into court. They're inadmissible. But they decided to try and prove their innocence. They would take polygraphs. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Would you like yeah. to tell the viewers what what happened with that? They, they took, Corrine did the polygraph first um, and passed, with, yeah, his mum, passed with flying colours. 
Um, no deception indicated. Terry Mullins. What questions did they ask her? Do we know? Oh, Corinne was asked if she'd lied about Luke's whereabouts, if she just if she um, destroyed any evidence or anything that that might have implicated him. And Scott, can you remember what the third one was? I always forget the third one in both it, of them. It, I think I think it was an alibi. Did she lie for an alibi? If I remember correctly. Yeah. So so basically, did she cover up oh. for him in any way, shape, or form? And she See, found it in all of these. She... No, no deception. No, no de deception detected. Absolutely telling the truth. Terry, Terry Mullen said it's, it's absolute. You know, the, the, she's passed this so well. Two or three months later. Now, bear in mind, Corinne did not know what the questions were going to be until she was in the room with the man. You get no advance warning until you, he's actually sitting across the table from you. Mm -hmm. So fast forward two or three months and the prison agreed to allow Luke to take the polygraph as well. Same polygraph examiner and the same thing. Luke gets no prior warning of what the questions are going to be till he's sitting across the table for this guy. And I sat in the room in the but back it, corner. It, surely Luke must go into this knowing that they're going to ask him, did you kill Jodie? Yes, I mean, he must know that they're going to ask him yes. that. And and bear in mind as well that the polygraphs are not 100% accurate. So he was taking the risk that even if he was telling the truth, there was that 5% chance that... Could go you know, the wrong way. A, a, so what a, questions did they ask him apart from, did you kill Jody? Did he kill her? Um, did he know exactly where her body would be found? Did he harm her in any way at all? And the answer to all of those was no. And right. again, he passed. No detection, right. uh, no deception detected. Hundred percent, um, telling the truth. Correct. So, we've also two or three things I want to say. There's other things that we haven't introduced today. We don't have time because we've got to move on to the new evidence. But there were other people who weren't questioned. There's the, we haven't mentioned the moped boys, Scott, and the the people they destroyed this moped, and the, they were related to Jody and Jody's Jody's own <laughs> grandmother told them not to yeah. step forward. To give the police evidence and their own our own granddaughter's murder yeah. the people who were the police were looked for five days and they destroyed this moped they'd been seen at the scene of the crime all sorts of things that haven't happened that we haven't managed to discuss today but one thing i should say you scott and sandra have offered those people um and other witnesses to come forward to take a polygraph you pay their expenses you pay for the polygraph yes. and they have declined to do that uh, Robbie, every proceed in, in my book, it's no reach 10,000 of them, there's nowhere near it. But the first 10,000 pound in my book is ring fenced. It was donated, a, a businessman in Edinburgh donated 10,000 pound to me, ring fenced it. And any person that I've named, Gordon Dickey, David Dickey, Joseph Jones, and uh, or John Ferris, to take a polygraph test, or Alan Owens, his stepfather, take a polygraph test and put it all to bed. Just answer any one of them. Not, not one of taken the offer, not one. Yeah. And one of the ones we should mention is Jody's own brother, oh. who, um, shall we say, had been sectioned several times, who was an own psychotic, who was um, overindulging on cannabis. Yeah. Roddy, there's se several suspects. Mark Payne, a man I took to the police station the day after Jody's murder, they never interviewed him till after Luke was convicted. Right, he, he had a bad history, he violence, self harm, off his right, cocktail of drugs, never question. Two men, Gordon Dickey and, and John Ferris, moped boys, they were at the scene at the very time Jody was being murdered, never right, treated yeah. as a suspect. They didn't come forward for five days. John Ferris tells the police, my grandmother, Jody's grandmother also, Alice Walker, told me not to come forward. And as soon as he told the police that, Jody's brother is going to hurt him. Jody's mum and Jody's granny, Alice Walker, again, threaten him. My Joseph is going to hurt you. So Joseph Jones will go, what? is that frightened? The John Ferris leaves Dalkeith and moves to Ayrshire. Now, recently, a couple of years ago, myself and Sandra are going through uh, files and um, jo Joseph's medical records, right? Five weeks, Roddy, five weeks before Jody was murdered, jo Joseph Jones, Jody's brother, was sectioned under the Mental Health Act. For beating Jody. Now, in all the statements, he ragdolls her, his sisters, he drags him about with the hair, he swings him about with the hair. Jody's dragged. So he's any more as, as Jody's attacker. Jody was dragged about with the hair and 
Joseph Jones's section for this five week fire and murder. He, he was administered the maximum amount of antipsychotic drugs that the law permits. Think of how dangerous that is. The, 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 right? To calm him down. Now, he, they don't want to release him back to his home because they say back in his home, his mother's psychotic also. Jody's mum's psychotic. She's a heavy drinker on the day they murder. She's on double vodka for 12 in the, in the afternoon. So they don't want to send them back to his home because he, the home environment is bad for Joseph. So they, send, they have to send them back. He, he, he becomes paranoid when he smokes cannabis resin. So they send them back to his home. He doesn't take his medication, right? Medication's wearing off four or five weeks later when Jody's murdered. And on the day Jody's murdered, he's been on bucket bombs for three days. Now, for your viewers, a bucket bomb is done through water in a two-litre bottle of coke, you know, like the plastic bottles. Hmm. And you smoke the cannabis through that, through it, it's like a, you know, like a bucket. It blows your mind, God. Yeah, it's like oh, a, oh, a, a crude shisha type. Yes, 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 a crude, crude shisha type. That's yes. And it, done with a, and, and it blows your mind. It's like taking 10 joints in one hit. Now, he's been on aim for three days, so we know for his medical records he's paranoid for smoking hash. You know his medications were off because he's not taking any. And then he gets identified as the last person to see Jody because he's following her. See when Alan Owen said they left the house. He left the house with Jody. He, he gets identified as a stocky man, I think, four weeks into the investigation. Oh, Jody was last seen on New uh, East House's Road getting followed by a stocky man. The stocky man is Joseph Jones. He was identified as following his sister. And by that time, they never even investigate them. They were too focused on Luke Mitchell. And uh, am I right in saying that even now, he's still never been questioned on the uh, murder of his sister? No, ah, no, no. Listen, R R Roddy, it's actually quite bizarre. Sandra, correct me, I get mixed up sometimes in these. But Joseph, after his sister's murder, jo jo Joseph Jones, nobody knows where he is all day. They own, when he, he's upstairs allegedly sleeping in his bed, but his mother knows he's here because she can hear him, but he's saying he's sleeping all day, but nobody sees him. Nobody knows where he has been for like one, I think one o'clock in the afternoon, no, I one o'clock in the afternoon yeah. to one, nearly one o'clock in the morning. And the only interaction with police he has after Jody's death is he confirms who he is and what relation he has to Jody, and then he just disappears. We think, so we think, we can't who, confirm. Who Go told uh, Jody that they, when talking about uh, the Reed Lassie, that they left the house? Alan, Alan who Owen left the house with Jody? Who's they? Uh, the stepfather. The don't, stepfather said it, but who, who is they? Who was we the person know. accompanying Jody? We don't know. Luke, Luke assumed and he actually said in his police statement, I thought he just meant Jody. So so he said they've just left, and, and Luke was like, well, a he was only asking about Jody, so he assumed he just meant Jody. But mm -hmm. we've got back to that time and time again. Alan Ovens never denied saying it. So we've got Luke saying he definitely said it. They've gone back to Alan Ovens and he hasn't denied it. So mm -hmm. so they left. <laughs> Who were they? Exactly. My question exactly. So anyway, we've covered it. Um, and because of this, Jody gets the maximum life imprisonment sentence on this sham um, of evidence. Um, and if, am I right in saying that if he was to admit tomorrow that he'd committed the crime, he would be paroled out, he would get freedom from jail, is that correct? Eventually, he, yeah. It, it'd be, it'd go he would, the but he's refused to do that. He refuses Absolutely. to admit because he didn't commit the crime. And he wants well, to clear his he, name. He got a recommendation in 20 years, so he must serve 20 before he can even ask for parole. So I think it's 17, uh, 17, 18 years and now. So he's got another two years and he can be paroled if he admits his guilt. And he's not Next year, Scott. Next eh? year, because he, he was held. Is it next year? Okay. Ah, he was held in land for the, before the trial. Ah, so he still maintains he's innocent, Roddy. He's uh, the prison prison staff tell me that he's, uh, his records are immaculate. Listen, there's very been in prison all these years. He's, he's had to defend himself, as you can imagine. Uh, he's never admitted his guilt. Most prisoners, and, and are, because of my, my line of work and people I, I, I speak to, most prisoners believe he's innocent. Yeah. There is a few prison officers 
who put the boot into him, if you like, you know, like to try and stop him getting this or that, and, and then the run to the sun or the Daily Record, oh, we caught him a, a nude magazine, you know, right? In the 20 years, that's what they've heard of him. And the, and the boy continues to tell you he never committed that crime. That in itself is quite a remarkable thing. Um, being in prison for all that time, Roddy, is a, is, is a beast. That's a, I want a better word. And he's came through it. Listen, mm -hmm. I don't know how, how, how badly damaged the boy's going to be and stuff. But that in itself, you, you can't do it, Roddy. That's impossible. I, I, me personally, I find that impossible to serve all that time in prison and, and maintain that innocence for all these years. I find impossible if he was guilty. Which I don't believe he is. I believe Luke Mitchell's innocent. Oh, I know that. But, so, I am 100 percent sure of it. Right. Well, on that, in November of last year, let's move on to what this is about. Uh, in November of last year, um, you got alerted that Police Scotland were starting to destroy evidence. Isn't that right, Sandra? Yeah. And yeah, they were destroying it quick earlier than they should have. Three years. Three years earlier. Yeah. Nine, ten, so, three years. Or 26. Last, last appeal, 2014, so it's 12 years, 2026, before they were allowed to that destroy evidence. Do you remember last time we spoke, Roddy? And, and you say, uh, we need a policeman with a conscience. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. There you go. Police person with a conscience, shall we say. Right? Mm -hmm. Contacted us. And they uh, and, uh, come, come and sat, sat us down and showed us they, they, they gathered up 3,000. By the way, we're not talking uniform police here, Roddy. And we're not no. talking about civilian workers. We're talking about serious crime squad based in Livingston. Men who are allegedly supposed to be tracking terrorists and murderers. They travel through Edinburgh with a van and they start collecting every production in the Luke Mitchell case. Every production to destroy. Now, I'll let Sandra join in and because I'll just So you, you get told this um, mm -hmm. and you, you immediately step in to get it halted. Yes. Hey, oh, listen to you. Yes, yes. Now, how long did it take you, Sandra, before you could get it halted? Uh folks, it's got about three days, two days, something like that. Oh, well, I must I must give a mention. Can I mention them? A man who is a PC with the same person. First name is you, and you went to the same school as him. <laughs> <laughs> he wrote the letter, and the letter is, is beautifully written. Yeah. And then, um, well, of course, <laughs> it's not education, does it? <laughs> it's actually brilliant. But they come back right away and, and told us they had been destroying evidence, but they would stop. Fair enough. And then, um, oh, listen, I let Sandra, I was just. So, you get, get them to you stop to destroying. But how much? Before I get to how much evidence have they destroyed, I want to know who authorised in the first place the destruction of this but, evidence, Sandra? This is where it gets really interesting. So we got them to stop, and then we went, we went back to them and, and in the same letter actually said, who authorised this? Why are you doing it now? Yeah. What's gone? What's still there? So this was all in the same letter that said, stop right now. So they came back and said, yes, we've stopped. And we're waiting for the answers to the other questions who authorized it why now nothing so this mm -hmm. went back and forward back and forward and then we got a letter that said that the the ps office had given permission for them to return items that were not on the indictment return not destroy and then weeks after that we get a letter from police scotland that says no 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 they told us we could destroy items not on the indictment could or should destroy could okay. could why but, do they do that why well, would they do that what's interesting about this is there is a process for that after the 12 years but they also said in this letter well we didn't use that process we, we made up a new one and it's it's really it's just the same as the other one except there's no paper trail and there's no signatures it's all right, there's nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, we accidentally destroyed 1,600 productions that were on the indictment as well. In Roddy, what, words, what? Sorry, destroyed no. everything. What's very important here, Roddy, the, the Crown 
led by Dorothy Bean, I must say, right? Uh, the Lord advocate Dorothy Bain, who's married to Alan Tumble, the prosecutor, Luke Mitchell. Now, they, they, when they gave permission for certain <coughs> items to be returned or could be destroyed, they were not on the indictment. These these productions were hidden from the defence. Look, just off the top of my head, I'm going to, a Green Parker court. Luke Mitchell was accused of burning a Green Parker court. Craig Doby told the High Court that they never had any other search warrants. That's lies. They had a search warrant for a house in Woodburn and Dalkeith. A Luke Mitchell school friend and they took a Green Parker coat and put it away, hid it to the defence. And then still went with his narrative that Luke Mitchell had the Green Parker coat, no his school friend. They had a large bowie knife found in a skip with the tip broken off, covered in blood, hidden for the defence. They had Jody's psychology reports, we could have found out massive amounts of what was going on in life. I'm not going to that at this time, and then um, hidden for the defence. Two diaries belong to Jody, hidden for the defence. So the Crown are now saying, get rid of all this stuff that we hid for the defence. They, they keep the Crown in the clear. So they, my, this is only me, my opinion. The Crown are destroying evidence that could implicate them in disclosure issues. Yeah. But then, as Sandra just says, in addition to that, the police then say, we erroneously, erroneously, they then only destroy every production that was on the indictment. So they destroy stuff known in the indictment and then they erroneously destroy 1,600 productions. 3,000 productions all in destroyed, Roddy. There is not one piece of evidence left in the Luke Mitchell trial. Not one production. What they failed, what they failed in, is that they were destroying every trace. We all know, listen, the SMP are famous for it. Destroy every paper trail, destroy it, and, and there's no links. They des destroyed everything. What they did not do is when they sent the list back to Sandra and the lawyers, we, we went through and we found stuff that had been hidden for us and uh, forensic stuff that, that I'm, I'm, I'm laughing again, Roddy, because this is just scandalous. In, in addition to destroying 3,000 productions four years earlier or three years earlier, uh, we threw a paper trail and whatever. We now find forensics that were never never disclosed and never tested. And, and I'll genuinely I'll let Sandra tell you this because it's, it's mind blowing stuff, Roddy. Mind blowing. Fif 15 deposits of sperm are on that wee girl. And none of them were tested. Sorry, that's a lie. Two were tested and then it proved inconclusive. So there's 13 sperm deposits on Jody's body. And I'm going to say where it's found, if you don't mind, on her breast, her cheeks, her bum, her abdomen, and her breasts. And, uh, and none of them were tested, Roddy. None of them were tested. Oh, and I'll let Sandra go down. The, the, incredible, the incredible thing about that, and it, is, it blows my mind, they destroyed all the, let's call it the physical stuff, okay, the, the clothing, the photographs, the branches, the, you know, they destroyed all of that. But they didn't destroy the forensic swabs and the forensic samples. They were still there. Now, I can, I can only, I can only think that was a form of arrogance that they thought they had plenty of time to get rid of everything. They didn't expect us to find out. But those forensic samples are still there. We can test them if they'll release them for testing. Now, what we have in here, and, and it's not just the samples on Jodie's body, and I think it's really important to, to um, point that out. The fingernail scrapings, they always said um, they only got one hand and they came back with nothing. We now find out that the scrapings for both sets of fingernails are in these samples. And I've been speaking with an expert in the, the US who's sent me details of 20 cases where the conviction has been overturned on nothing else but evidence from under fingernails that they were told at the beginning there was nothing there. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, there are other samples on the clothing still, and, and this hidden file, this this is, <laughs> if you take, for example, there, there was, there was a, a, a um, deposit on Jodie's brass strap that was a mixed profile. So it was male and female. And what they tried to say was that Luke couldn't be excluded from that profile. Well, that's true. But neither could half a dozen other people, including the senior investigating officer, it just the, the, the bits of their profile that the bits of the profile that turned up in the sample matched the bits of their profile. All right. So that's that's why I was saying earlier, uh, uh, um, a partial can't be used to 
to identify anybody because we've all got bits of our DNA profiles in common. Anyway, this one on the bra, this is the one that they tried to nail Luke with and got ripped apart with at trial. We now find that there are sequentially numbered samples in the hidden file labelled semen. So that they've, they've gone tape, 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 right? And they've got four, mm -hmm. or tape, 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 tape. They've got four samples all around this, this one partial, hidden, never been tested. But, but why didn't they test it? Well, that's what I was just going to say. The reason, speaking to some of the forensics guys, the reasons they didn't test those is because of the very high likelihood that they would have identified the actual male contributor in this partial sample if they got all five of them and done them all, they'd have been able to see marker patterns, which would have identified the real person who left that. But why wouldn't the police want to do that? Why? I mean, that's surely the police's job. Why wouldn't they do that? Because it wouldn't have been Luke. <laughs> they wouldn't have come back as Luke. Astonishing. It's absolutely it. astonishing. Um, but I'm going to... I'll tell you for years, I, I've not wanted to go down the full corruption route. I've wanted to go down the errors, stupidity, you know, incompetence. And in the last two years, yeah. there comes a point yeah. where there are only so many. <laughs> yeah, but so, which begs the question, who, who authorised the changing of the procedures with no paper trail? Someone had to say you can do that, you don't need to use paper. Still have no idea who, who was no. responsible for that. Who's a, who's, who heads the crown? Well, Dorothy Bain. It's the only place they can go. I don't want to and go Dorothy to Bain's husband yeah. prosecuted Luke yes. Mitchell in the first place. And I, I, I don't want to go to saying that if, if this was overturned, um, mm -hmm. it would be embarrassing for the prosecutor. Terrible 100%. 20 years in jail, but it's yes. worse that you don't embarrass a prosecutor. Am yes. I right? Yes. 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 Rodney, think, think this. He, he, he prosecuted Lockerbie also. And Dorothy Bain was in America recently speaking in American authorities about the new Lockerbie bomb maker. But she's telling you Scotland are not going to prosecute this man. He says, fine, America, he's been to Amer Americans. We are prosecuting him. But if Scotland prosecuted him, it would look bad on a husband. Yeah. He, he prosecuted he prosecute him. And that, he also done, listen, he, he's very controversial. Look at his convictions. Um, Nat Fraser, Luke Mitchell, R. McGracky, and uh, Biggs, you know, the, the limbs in the lock. He, he's a brilliant, <laughs> Alan Tumble's a, a legal genius, for want of a better word. Um, he, but, and, and, and he comes to lock up using. It's also going to, it, let's be honest, it's also going to destroy um, our, our man, uh, oh, Donald Finlay. And it, all it's, this stuff was there and, he, and he, didn't, he didn't win the case. So it's going to destroy well, him as well. If I, I found this, innocent. So he could only use it if he knew it was there. Uh, if this stuff was hidden from him. Yeah. The, well, why isn't he acting now? Why hasn't he stepped in? Yeah. Don't know. <laughs> the, the, the thing, the thing, we, I, I didn't want to... Are you, are you suggesting there's a closing of ranks here at the legal fraternity? Well, yeah, listen, I'm kind of scared of that, Roddy, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Um, Alan Tumble's a very influential man, shall we say, very, well, listen, probably the top high court judge in Scotland. His wife's daughter, if he made the Lord Advocate. And, uh, and, 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 and me... Uh, you know, it's Angelina come and saying that they're corrupt. People don't, aren't they going to listen to that and they'll close rank to protect their own. And I didn't want to go down that road because people, conspiracy, will do yeah. on that side. I think, this is only my opinion, Roddy, I think they destroyed every piece of production. And I'll tell you why I think. I think when it gets into court, it's going to take a long time to get this back into court. And also a big argument, even if we'll get access to forensics to get tested again. People think you just write a letter to the Crown and the Crown hands stuff over his solicitors. Well, look, the Crown just tell you to piss off because well, there's so a who's conviction. Going be, who's going oh. to be responsible for that final decision about whether we get the samples or not? It goes, well, so the, Lord Advocate, the Lord Advocate says whether you can or can't. Yes, so yes. round it goes. Yes. But surely on this case, she should be recused. She should recuse herself from this, surely. She has done in other cases, but so far she shows no signs of um, distance herself in any way, shape or form. She's the one that um, dismissed the 25,000 signature petition without a blank, 
because she but thinks so, there's, there's nothing wrong with the conviction. Let, let me see if I've got this right. On Just on the new evidence that we have and the new sperm samples, there is enough, you believe, you believe, there's enough evidence there, if it's tested, that will identify the real killer of Jodie Jones. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes. yes. The Lord Advocate is preventing that testing. Well, we, we don't yeah. know yet. We haven't applied for it yet. Right, so you're going to apply for it. So, so we need we need that to get done. Now, what yeah. can my viewers do to help this situation? Right to their MPs, their MPs. Roddy, we spoke, remember the last time we spoke and I says, ah, listen, people, there's some people within politics have got an eye for justice. Listen, we went to Parliament, we had 25,000 signatures, Roddy, listen, not one of them cared. Uh, I, I, we got, I hate to say this, the only people that cared were three Tory MPs, MSPs, Murdo Fraser and Liz Smith, they, they were at another demonstration and me grabbed them, excuse me, come here. Do you, have, do you have a look at this petition? And I gave him a book and place so they acknowledged it. Russell Finlay, Justice Secretary, he come out of Parliament to meet myself and Sandra, right? And discussed it. But uh, Russell's busy with other things and I appreciate that. But not one, and I mean not one, MSP or anybody. I went to Jana, I went to everybody. Everybody allegedly in this group, there any justices in uh, Not one, not one. They pay lip service to it. They just ah, they didn't even pay you lip service on. Look, I know. I said sent a copy of our, our video to the justice secretary and asked him to acknowledge that he'd received it and he would at least watch it. Mm -hmm. I get no re I get no acknowledgement. And I'm going to send it to to whoever the justice secretary is, the new justice secretary. Oh. Yeah, look, look, um, supporters wrote in their in their hundreds to their local to their own MSPs, and they were all getting the standard letter back saying we can't intervene. Um, in individual cases, separation of powers. Right, hang on, separation of powers. <laughs> the Lord Advocate sits in, the, in the, the cabinet when it suits them. Yeah, but the, this, uh, this is the They're looking after a political enemy, it suits them. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, so, so what, your, what your audience can do is, rather than write on behalf of Luke Mitchell as an individual case, they can question the state of justice in <laughs> Scotland that allows these things to happen, then it's not an individual case, then it's processes in the Scottish justice system. You know, why but is that going to get Luke out? Is that going to get Luke justice? No, 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 no but at least we, it might we, we want to get Luke justice. So, I think we need to uh protest, I think we need to write to our MPs or MSPs, we need to write to the justice secretary, we need to make write to the newspapers, we need to really make a noise. Yeah, we need to yeah. make a noise. Well, the 25,000 people. 25,000. I've seen less petitions being all oh, greeted with such well, We've got a new government now, Scott. It's a completely uh, new cabinet. Resubmit uh, it. Oh, do you mean well, you're well, like, like a politics? Can know, you imagine? I know that, but resubmit it and let's publicise it. We're resubmitting no. it. I was, um, General, I'll tell you my protest. I want to go to the parliament and throw these piece, pieces of paper for the gallery. Listen, there's a petition that you wouldn't accept or paste them to the new Justice Secretary's office. Or, but, listen, look, look, to get Luke Mitchell back in the court, first, we, we must get access to these samples. Now, that's yeah. going to be a fight. Everybody watching this and they'll all laugh. Ah, 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 Mitchell isn't he getting out in another two years. He's still in prison because the Lord Advocate may just say you're not getting the access to the samples. You have to fight them. You might even have to go to the appeal court and ask the appeal court permission to access these. And then the appeal court just said, ah, the case is closed. True. And, and, and that's what happened. It, it, it pains me to say this <laughs> um, from my political point of view. What about the Supreme Court in, in London? Or the European uh, Court of Justice? Yeah. What, about, what about those avenues? The, the arguments for that are quite, remember we had a look at them, the arguments of that for that are quite convoluted. And, and we would still have to um, uh, like use up We'd have to complete the domestic, the routes to domestic remedy first. Um, so, so it is one that could be done, but it's it's more convoluted. Can we not go to the court of session? Or is there no way you can bypass round the Lord Advocate? Well, I, I think there is. <laughs> it's then finding a an ad. Well, right now, Roddy Dunlop is a 
acting on behalf of Luke. I must. I, I, some people say you should be mentioning, but I must tell you how decent that man was. Roddy. Uh, Luke Mitchell, uh, legal aid bill must be in the hundreds of thousands of pounds. Two, three hundred. Every lawyer I've known that's worked on this case, I've mulked, mulked, and I use that word, mulked. Everybody talks about legal aid and lawyers didn't get good money, Roddy. Nonsense. If I gets landed at Luke Mitchell's and, and you get 10 pence for every page you read. You don't read any yet, but you claim you've read every page. And, right? Hundreds of thousands of pounds have been spent on Luke Mitchell's defence. We use that one very lightly, by the way, right? So Roddy Dunlop, when first approached, agreed that if he couldn't get legal aid, he would act on Luke Mitchell's behalf pro bono. Now, for the KC, I keep saying QC. He's a good man. Ah, yeah, they very. Listen, he's got a good heart. And, and they even man. come and see that. And QCs are normally very aloof and never get involved. And, right, but he came and says, I'll do that pro bono if you don't get legal aid. Luckily, legal aid was granted. And, and, and it's a long time since I've done it. But to fill in legal aid applications, you put forward an argument. Now, Luke Mitchell's got brilliant arguments, especially now with all this stuff that's been destroyed and what's been not, not been disclosed. So I think you'll get legal aid continuously if the application filled in properly, right? And somebody like Roddy Dunlop, with his influence, and who he is, but he's also, he's in that circle, Roddy. He's in the same circle as uh, Alan Tumble and Dorothy Bain. I'm not saying they're all friends, but we will be sitting and having lunch together. They, they, you know, there's no saying that, but he has got influence, and that influence may work, maybe, to, to get access, if we get access to the forensics. Only my opinion, uh, it's an opinion I shared by Sandra and, and other people, forensic experts, everybody you speak to, everybody believes if we get access to the forensics that were hidden, uh, they, they will prove definitively, the word definitively, who killed Jody Jones. Now, and, and, you, have, uh, and have you have you spoken to Mr. Dunlop? Uh, listen, on this on this new matter. Uh, um, he, he, Roddy Dunlop can, he, can only take instructions for Luke Mitchell's solicitor. And who's, but well, you're his solicitor, you know? Oh, I'm, his, I'm a lawyer, Roddy, I investigate the crime. I don't right. represent Luke Mitchell legally. Luke, Luke McCready and Co, I think, in Glasgow is his solicitor right now. And they can only instruct Luke Mitchell. I've got a mandate for Luke Mitchell, same as Sandra, to, to, to well, carry have you, spoke, have you spoken to McCready and Co? Yes, yes, Sandra speaks. Yeah. Well, and have they agreed to talk to Roddy? It's all happened so, so quickly. The wheels, the wheels are in motion. Yes, yes. yes. But because it's anything it's our right. viewers can do. Right, right, right to the crown, right to your politicians, but and, and, and demand, request, demand that we, we get access to the friends. Demand, demand, I access yeah. to the these the friends. We, yeah. we are looking potentially at another peace, another peaceful protest. Um, on the 14th of April, it will be exactly 19 years since Luke was arrested um, and held on remand. So we're looking at potentially a, a peaceful protest round about there, maybe the Saturday the 15th, so a couple of weeks well, from now. Um, if you're doing it, if you're going to do it, let me know and I will put it out on our channels and my my, my blog posts, etc. Yeah. Get my, a lot of my colleagues in this to, to help. Yeah, the, anyway. the point of this one is just to say to let them know we know. Yeah. You know, you're not yeah. hiding this for anybody anymore. We know. A silent you... protest outside the Lord Lord's oh. office would be a good thing. Yeah. Um, okay. Just for example. Um, <laughs> Scott, Sandra, thanks so much for giving me your time. And oh. uh, what we know, what the viewers do know is this is not just been straightforward putting this wee segment together. But with some technical difficulties, folks, and travel <laughs> difficulties and whatnot. So that's why when we said it was going to come out earlier in the week, and it didn't. It'll. So um, I hope you have found this as interesting and infuriating and frustrating um, as I have, because that's how, and I can only imagine how you two, having devoted so much of your time and effort to this, how frustrated and angry and despondent you must get. But I, I, I doff my hat to you for your dedication to this case, and I hope that the day comes when we see you in the television with the cameras flashing and the champagne bottle and young Luke back out in freedom. Thank you very much for being here today.
Uh, Roddy, thank you very much. And uh, to you folks, till I see you all again, please, please, take care. Right. Thanks, Roddy. Through a Scottish prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.